Hey guys, welcome back to Young Americans Abroad. My name is Austin. And my name is Patrick. And welcome to our show. Well guys, we are back again, Pat. It's fun to be here. And uh, we've got, you know, some interesting performances this week, some good storylines, a lot to get to today. Yeah, definitely, right? I mean, Europa League, Champions League, and then obviously weekend games, things like that. A lot of Americans now overseas, which is um, music to my ears, Austin, all the fans here. It's so great to just have a plethora of uh, you know, talent to talk about week by week, right? Instead of a few people being out in the past few years, and then we would have nothing. There's, there's always content now. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really good to see. You know, we're, we're here for it, right? So, uh, yeah, we also want to say, you know, put a little teaser out there. We got a new intro coming, so uh, be on the lookout for that in the coming weeks. Yeah, I've been working hard. Some some great music, some great visuals. Uh, you know, like you said, Austin, we're just excited uh, for you guys to, you know, immerse yourself right in that intro. Get really hyped, and then we'll dive into <laughs> the topics, right? So um, stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. And we also are looking to the future and we've got Mexico coming up. So big game. We're really excited about that. Uh, you know, we're gonna have some live streams around that. And I think, you know, this week, especially a lot of these players that we saw, uh, you know, are really kind of rounding into form, right? Like Wes McKinney looking really good for Juventus, even though they may not be doing so hot. Uh, he's he's looking like he's in fine form uh, with some of our other players. So it was good to yeah. see. That's, that's a perfect segue, Austin, because that's our, that's our first player, right? They're really that's stepping right. <laughs> in for Mexico. Um, seeing players round the form is just awesome because we need to be at our A game to, you know, really stay the kings of CONCACAF and, and maybe overtake them in the standing soon. But to Weston McKinney, right? Uh, Juventus is in a, a strange spot, Austin, and we can get into that a little bit more. But just recapping what Weston has been able to do in Syria, he's – scored his first two goals of the season in the league and personally rounding into form. I think the last game against Sassuolo, they did lose 2-1. Uh, tough performance there. We had a great header. I believe it was off a Dybala free kick, but obviously he is elite, right, that we've talked about um, in the air uh, winning those headers. And then over this past weekend, they did lose again 2-1 to Verona. So McKinney had a rocket of a goal. Uh, it was awesome, but Obviously, they were down two already, gave up the lead really early on and, and played a much better second half. And uh, once McKinney subbed on in that game over this past weekend, right, in the second half with, I believe it was um, Locatelli, they didn't start. And you could see the immediate impact that they had in the game. Uh, just a lot of the one-touch combinations, a lot of chances created in the box. And obviously, McKinney with a thunderous shot there uh, in the center of the box. So... Uh, it was really great to see him, right, get in target here, get in form. Um, but really, Juventus dropping points in the league. I think they're, what, ninth in Serie A, which is yeah, probably not the good. worst. <laughs> I don't know how many years. I don't know when you can look back, right? If there are any diehard die Juventus fans, um, tell us when they were this bad to start Serie A. Um, so that's unfortunate. But good for McKinney, right, to be putting himself in a better place where there are rumors before – if he was on his way out, you know, people questioning him and things like that, Austin. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, again, even though Juventus may not be playing so well, um, I think Wes McKinney's really been making a difference for them when he's come onto the pitch. Um, and you really saw it, you know, in that game where he scored that goal. Um, you know, he, he was, a, you know, a difference maker in that game, right? Like he was someone who uh, was looking to to make plays for Juventus. He, he was playing with intent. Um, and I think even today, you know, in the game, uh, you know, the Champions League game that he played in uh, for Juve, uh, just seeing him, you know, on the pitch, kind of running at players, uh, really, you know, playing those one-two touches, right, in and around the box, getting players open, uh, looking like upfield, right, always looking to create, not just looking to kind of pass back. Because uh, a lot of those players at Juventus, right, you know, we've seen it before, right, Benton Cord, you know, doesn't really love to, to pass forward too much. Some other players they have there um, just haven't really been as aggressive as I feel like they need to be uh, to get this team back to where it was. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I feel like that's kind of what Weston McKinney brings to this team and what he has been bringing recently, at least. 
Yeah. So you mean they don't want to pass it to Murata up there? Um, <laughs> um, Sadly, you know, no. That's a tough <laughs> shot. That's a tough shot. I, I shouldn't say anything. You know, I, I'm sitting here <laughs> at a professional at a Serie A club. But um, regardless, yeah, like you said, with this game, uh, a big win. The Champions League, Juventus is actually playing fairly well. Uh, they won 4-2 against uh, the Zenit team, right? That's that's a little bit different in terms of some level of competition they're used to in Serie A. Nonetheless, though, McKinney started and played the full 90 there, Austin, and had a really high-impact game. Uh, what I noticed, too, which was a little bit different, obviously the confidence is up. The team looked a little bit more together, not just a bunch of individuals. And McKinney was really, a, you could almost say, pretty much a focal point there in the midfield. He was, seems like he was more animated calling for the ball, like teammates weren't bypassing, looking directly to go to him, and then he would springboard it on or play one-touch combinations. And then, of course, driving forward and, and getting more forward than Murata and some of the other attackers. So in and around the box and just the impact that he has, uh, he is really turning things around. And uh, um, obviously, it's great to see the team clicking in all cylinders because, yeah, it just seemed like they were they were a little bit selfish, individual at, at times when things are going wrong, right? Um, but it seems like they're starting to get it a little bit back on track. And Allegri has them playing a better way. And uh, McKenney is a, a huge part of that. Yeah, and uh, Allegri called him a Mazella, right? Like a player who uh, is, yeah. I guess, a box-to-box midfielder, a player that can kind of get upfield and, and score. Forgive me for my lack of Italian soccer knowledge, but uh, really, you know, a player that looks to score, right? That that was kind of Allegri's big point with McKinney. He's not just, you know, a holding midfielder or someone who should contribute, you know, on defense and really run around the pitch and try and win the ball back. He's someone that can actually get up field and get into positions where he should be able to score goals. Uh, And that's what he's been doing recently, right? Two goals in his last three games uh, had a, you know, a thunder of a shot today in the champions league that really should have, should have went in uh, if he had a little bit better luck. And uh, yeah, yeah. So far so good this season with, with Weston again, Weston's found himself in these situations from time to time where like, you know, he's really under the, the microscope, right? He's, you know, for that being his own reasoning or, you know, just being in a position that, you know, his team has put him in and he's really responded well in a lot of these situations. So yeah, uh, I feel like that's a good mark of like a truly, you know, talented player, a player that, you know, has that special ability that most players don't possess. So I don't know. Yeah. That's just my take. And quickly to add, right. I think it's so important how he responded and reacted just to everything, right. With the, the U S and that, that story, right. It's, it's like uh, water under the bridge at this point, he put his head down. He was getting results for the U S helping there. And then back at his club, uh, albeit like you said, maybe Juventus isn't performing optimally, but Weston has made such an impact in, in, in what he's doing, right. Just, just water under the bridge for him. He has that great mentality. Just keep moving forward, put all that behind him. And it's great to see before Mexico. Yeah, exactly. I, I couldn't agree more, Pat. So I think with that, we're going to move over to, Austria now uh, and talk. Oh, sorry. Actually, we're going to move to Germany. Excuse me. I'm getting ahead of myself. Close, right? Kind of close there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're going to move to Germany and talk about, a, you know, our player that's really been a fan favorite this year from, from our end of things here on Ya, and that's Joe Scally. So Joe Scally uh, started and played 63 minutes first and foremost uh, in Bayern, or sorry, in Gladbach's 5-0 win over Bayern in the DFB Pokal. Uh, so obviously, Pat, the result here is the big storyline, you know, crazy, crazy win for Gladbach, uh, you know, Byron put out some, some of their best players in this game and really just got, you know, thumped on the day. Yeah. Um, what happened? Then, That's unbelievable. Yeah. I think it was honestly just a combination of, of Gladbach coming out, playing confident, you know, they played against Byron earlier this year and had a lot of success in that game. Um, you know, really weren't afraid of Byron to be completely honest in that game. And I think the way they played really, you know, carried over and transcended into this game and yeah, they just got off to a great start, you know, got a few, uh, well, got an early goal and, and, and really kind of, um, you know, that, you know, perpetuated uh, more confidence yeah. and uh, just Byron losing confidence too, and not playing their best game, um, you know, as well. So uh, Joe in this game, you know, did did what he does, right? That's that's kind of what we're seeing now. Uh, looked confident, you know, going up against Byron's attackers. Uh, you know, didn't do too much getting forward in this game, from from what I remember. I know it's been a little while now, but uh, was was you know just very solid, right? Was a, a player that didn't look too phased at all, um, and really played played confident in this game. Um, so it was good to see. You know, it's always good to beat, you know, the best 
you know, the Kings of Bundesliga, right? Whatever it is yeah, now, nine good. times in a row. Uh, so, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's nice to see him not, and we've seen it before, right, and what he's been doing in the Bundesliga, but he just has that mentality. We, we talk about it all the time here, right? Somebody's not big, too afraid of the, the moment, like a, a big moment. Uh, obviously, maybe there's some rotation there with Bayern for this game, but it's still an elite club, like you said. I mean, there's a lot of players that you know, we've had previously and just – Players in general, right, that might get a little bit too nervous or anxious um, and just kind of let the moment swallow them and engulf them. And, and he's definitely not one of those players. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He's someone that, that uh, yeah, just hasn't looked like an 18-year-old, right? He's he's not been phased by the moment at all in the Bundesliga. And this is a big win for, for all German teams, to be completely honest. Knocking Bayern out of the DFB Pokal uh, means that, you know, any other club now can win it. It's their uh, game. <laughs> yeah, and and honestly, you know, with Bayern doing so well this year, some other teams struggling. I know Dortmund's up there at the top of the table, right? But, you know, we'll see kind of how the, the season unfolds. I feel like it still feels like a, a Bayern first type of Bundesliga season. Um, so this is just another opportunity for other teams to, you know, win another trophy uh, in an era where it's been tough to win trophies in Germany. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought that was really cool, um, you know, even from a perspective away from from Joe Scally. And then, uh, you know, earlier this weekend, or I should say just this weekend, uh, you know, Joe also started and played 90 minutes for Gladbach in their game versus Bochum and had an assist in this game. Uh, really came off a nice, you know, whipped in cross kind of towards the back post. Uh, just had really good trajectory on the ball from, from pretty far outside the box. And uh, yeah, that header went into the back of the goal. Uh, Joe Scally in this game, I believe, created three chances. So, you know, in, in watching the highlights, it was definitely apparent that uh, he was able to get forward and kind of, uh, you know, create a little bit more in this game than he was, you know, midweek in that game against Byron. Um, and that's what we've come to see from him, right? He's a player that's not afraid to take the ball up the field, really push his luck and, and, and try to get into positions where he can help his team going forward. Right. Uh, so that's something I've really, you know, also enjoyed about his game. He's, He's someone that can help a team going forward and, uh, you know, showed that as well in this game. Uh, and then again, Bochum's not the best team. So, uh, you know, he was able to get back and track, uh, you know, defensively. If he made a mistake, you know, I thought he was really good at being quick to, to kind of get back and make up for his, his mistakes. And, and honestly, that's something he's relied upon all year. So, um, you know, in this game, that was really, really no different. Um, I believe on FootMob he finished this game with an 8.0 rating, which is, you know, really good. And, and again, kind of par for the course this year, uh, which is exciting. So in seeing that, Pat, that kind of triggered something in my mind. You know, we've seen a lot of good games from him this year. Uh, I wanted to see where he ranked in the Bundesliga in terms of, you know, his ra rating on FootMob, which is the, you know, the app we predominantly use to track players. Uh, and, and again, it's not, I think you said this before we started filming, uh, it's not the Holy Grail, right? The, uh, <laughs> right, exactly. The, the book of, uh, you know, it's not the Bible in terms of, of ratings or anything like that. But I feel like it is a good, you know, measurement to at least, you know, get an idea of how good some some players are playing this year. Let's hear it. Let's, and, hear, the, let's hear the stats. And yeah, so so Joe Scally, I looked this up uh, and and based on predominant right backs, so, so players who are actually, uh, you know, mostly play their games at right back. Uh, which I feel like Joe Scali falls into. Um, obviously, he's played a little bit on the left. He's also played right wing back, but I think predominantly he's a right back. Uh, he ranks second in the Bundesliga in terms of rating uh, behind Lucas Kluber from uh, Freiburg. So, you know, I thought that was really cool. Uh, I think overall he's, you know, somewhere in the 60s, 50 to 60s uh, in terms of rating, which is a 7.23. Uh, so not bad for, again, an 18-year-old starting his first year in the Bundesliga uh, and already close to the winter break here now. Uh, you know, this isn't the beginning of the season anymore. This is, you know, middle of the Bundesliga season. And, uh, yeah, really positive so far uh, this season, Pat. Nothing yeah, more to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's only a few things with, with what you added there. Maybe you should just, like, slide some of those, those, pa those papers, right, or send the uh, – a PowerPoint or a Tableau dashboard <laughs> to Berhalter um, and say, these are the reasons why uh, Joe should, should start. Right. Or at least you know, get some game time there. So 
Well, yeah. well, Pat, he's definitely starting against Mexico. I mean, that, that's a <laughs> foregone conclusion. Like, yeah, foregone conclusion at this point. Yeah. I, I would love to see him against uh, Mexico's side, right? Um, just his tenacity, right? His, his ability to to get up, right? And it'll be interesting to see because some of those mistakes Mexico uh, seems to, a lot of their players, right, seem to capitalize. Um, obviously, some players like Giannis, right, not in um, form and some of these other players are their clubs, but – yeah, he'll be after if he if he gets some game time, especially in Concacaf opponents and, and with the pitches and, and just certain moments in the qualifiers, he'll have to be a little bit careful there. But nonetheless, everything that he offers, all the stats and the pros and, and the flip side of things, right, is is way the the pros outweigh the cons, right? So I mean, there's no reason he shouldn't be a part of this camp and should be getting some game time. Yeah, especially going towards, you know, the final round of this qualifying cycle, uh, preparing for the World Cup, excuse me, and also just looking ahead towards, you know, any injuries that come up. Uh, we've got players in some unusual situations, right? That that right back depth chart seems so, so big, you know, over the summer, it seemed like it was very deep and there was a lot of players vying for positions, but, you know, Reggie Cannon's in a weird position. Julian Rajo's now switched over to Mexico, um, you know, Shaq Moore is not getting playing time and didn't look great in the minutes he got uh, when he got called up recently. So, uh, yeah, DeAndre Yedlin is, you know, I don't know. He's, he's, he's okay, right? He's, he's kind of playing for Galatasaray. Uh, so, I, I, I don't know. I think, uh, like you said, Pat, there's a lot of merit to, to calling him up this camp. And we'll have to wait and see. You know, we got that announcement coming uh, a little bit later this week, maybe. And who knows? Maybe we'll do a live show about it, too. Yeah, so. yeah. And yeah, look out keep, for that. Your, uh, keep, uh, keep an eye out for that. And, yeah, it would be awesome to see Scali there. But I guess we'll shift gears, right, um, and go to Denmark and talk about a player we really haven't um, gone too much into depth, right, um, just some some quick kicks and, and a little bit here and there. But uh, Christian Kappas, a really interesting player, right, uh, that made a, a huge move from, you could say huge, right, from uh, the mm-hmm. Hobros, you know, our boys that – I had a pretty rough season collapse there um, the second tier to Bronby, uh, a team that's historically done very, very well um, in the Danish league at the top, getting some of those Champions League qualifiers um, to Europa League regulars, things of that nature, right? So uh, he's been great, has had great form, excuse me, coming off the bench. So he's found a way to make an impact with limited time and just accruing more and more minutes. I think get some starts in Europa and the European competition, which is great. Uh, he's had three goals, I think, uh, in the league and five goals and one assist so far this season um, with kind of second half minutes there. So even with this past weekend, they played uh, Viborg in a 1-0 win where he got the game winner. Uh, and only after 10 minutes of entering the match, he was already up the field, making a huge impact again. Similar to kind of McKenney there, um, obviously on the flip side getting a win. But nonetheless, right, uh, he, I think, during the build-up in the play, uh, Simon Hedlund's, uh had a cross from left wing um, into the middle of the box uh, where, you know, Kappas obviously slotted it home, you know, cool, calm finish um, to celebrate with the fans there, right, in the dying minutes of the game. So really great to see him make it such an impact here. And, yeah, it would be interesting to see, you know, where he goes. Obviously, this move is, is pretty recent. He was in a tough situation at Hobro. And hopefully he can claw his way more into that that starting eleven. Yeah, yeah, and he's really put together some good minutes for uh, you know, for Bronby this year. Um, you know, that I, I wasn't really sure what to expect from this move, you know, going from a two division team there in Denmark, and obviously Hobro wasn't that when he got there. Um, but moving to, you know, Danish champions or you know, a perennial power there in Denmark, uh Bronby. It was, I thought, going to be really interesting to see kind of how that sh- shook out for him. And so far, it looks like, you know, he's pretty much risen to that level, um, is getting good game time now, is really making a difference when he's on the pitch. And, uh, yeah, I really think, you know, you posed a really interesting question off camera to me that I'd love to kind of, you know, open up and talk about, you know, on our show today. And I'll let you introduce it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's a good question, right? And and for all you fans to comment below, but um, obviously there's a lot of hype with Luca De La Torre and what we've seen. It's great to see him in camp, but uh, Luca's Heracles, right? Compared to Bronby, obviously different leagues, right? Uh, with coefficients and, and rankings there in the competition, but 
uh, Bromby, right? <laughs> European Champions League, you know, qualifier type of team and been at the top of their league. And, and Heracles, right? You could say, what what's the comparison there? What What's the level drop um, to Luca De La Torre starting for them and, and Christian Cathy, right? Starting for a Bromby, um, if he gets to that point, which I think is going to be sooner than later, right? So I want to get your thoughts too, Austin, but I, I'm thinking it's pretty similar. I'd almost give the tilt. Maybe I'm, I'm more biased to clubs in Europa and Champions League, but I would give the tilt a little bit to Bronby. Yeah, and I think the caveat should be that that Kappas hasn't really nailed down a starting role for Bronby, right? As opposed yeah. to Luca De La Torre. Luca exactly. De La Torre is kind of a day-in, day-out starter for for Heracles, but I really, yeah, I kind of agree with you, Pat. I think when you look at Denmark, Bronby is pretty much the best team right now. Uh, Copenhagen's also a really good team there, but, um, you know, Bronby seems to be, um, you know, another really strong power. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Heracles is is really mid-table in my estimation um, in the Eredivisie, um, and that's also just from watching some of the Luca. De La Torre highlights, you know, that's a team that seems like they play very well against like the lower competition in, in the Netherlands. But then when it comes up against teams, you know, like, um, like Fire Nord, Ajax, PSV, you know, the real big powers, they, they really just crumble and, and kind of fold. So um, not to say that that wouldn't happen when Bronby plays them, but, you know, Bronby, like you said, plays in the Europa League. So, uh, and, and have, you know, done pretty decently recently. So, uh, yeah, I, I really think it's a good question. I, when you brought it up earlier, I was like, yeah, hmm, yeah if, if Christian Kappas is starting for, for Bronby, is he, you know, in a better spot than Luca De La Torre? And I don't know if, if he's able to, you know, get those consistent minutes and, and become a true starter for Bronby, then I would almost yeah, argue that's, yes. That's <laughs> exactly what you said, right? Uh, maybe more of a future question. If he gets that starting role, starting day in, day out, like Luca De La Torre is getting some serious minutes, right? So yeah, interesting to see kind of where that goes. And yeah, Cap is just an intriguing player, Austin, to, to you know quickly mention, right? He's he's six one. He's a pretty tall dude, athletic, yeah. and has a physicality there. Uh played kind of in that six before, but now Bromby's playing him way higher as an eight. Um getting involved in the attacks. So he's really improved on that end, something that you really need to work on, you know, driving with the ball, you know, that we saw Weston do with those incredible highlights, right? A little bit more one on one, you know, having that ability. But his wide ranging passing, be able to connect is, is definitely a, a great asset and somebody that we should be, you know, our, our eyes should be on, you know, watching those Bronby games more often. Yeah. And he also has that FC Dallas pedigree. So yeah, hey, yeah that's right. Hey, they've, they've developed a lot of good players, you know, in the past. So uh, yeah, yeah. It's just something else that's kind of, kind of interesting when you think about Christian Kappas is uh, yeah, he came yeah. from, you know, that, that same FC Dallas Academy that's produced, you know, Wes McKinney, yeah. uh, Chris Richards, Brian Reynolds, uh, you know, Justin Che, who's doing a really good job too, um, amongst others. So for FC Pepe, Dallas gotta, segment gotta mention him. FC but, Dallas segment, Austin? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll keep an eye on him. Um, you know, great job so far, Cappy, this year. And uh, yeah. we'll check back in with you soon. So uh, now moving over to Austria. Finally, we're going to get to Austria. Uh, we're going to talk about Brendan Aronson. So Brendan started and played 90 minutes um, and also had an assist in their 2-2 draw this weekend for, for Salzburg and really just, you know, stood out in this game. Um, you know, based on the stats, you know, he had five chances created uh, and also had four shots on goal. So, um, or I guess just four shots, not necessarily on goal, but yeah. uh, was really kind of, you know, the the creator on the day and, um, you know, was only able to, to get them a draw, but still, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, that assist really helped them get points in this game. Um, and, and just taking a look at where Salzburg are at right now, um, you know, they sit 12 points in the lead there in Austria. So it looks like, you know, Brendan's on pace to, to win his second Bundesliga title. And I guess his third trophy, uh, in two years, uh, when you count the trophy one last year for Salzburg, and then also, um, you know, the one, Supporter Shield for for the Union. Uh, I guess he won the Austrian Cup as well. So maybe four trophies in in two years. Um, more cabinets in his apartment. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, so far so good for him this year. Uh, you know, we've talked about him. You know, this season on Yah already. So don't want to belabor the point, but uh, really just coming into his own, uh, really workmanlike player. 
um, and someone that uh, has kind of been the the man for Salzburg this year. I know Kareem Adebayemi is is really um, you know the star of this team, but, oh, but yeah, Brendan Aronson's been kind of pulling the strings a little bit uh, in a lot of games. So you know, just just good to see him continuing to make an impact for them and and you know showing his class against some some lesser competition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us are clamoring, right? And just seeing how it goes and. and... I don't know. I wouldn't say I'm personally in a rush to see him go anywhere else, right? But it almost seems like obviously getting the Champions League experience is fantastic. But he's really kind of outgrowing that league, and I'd love to see him play a little bit day in, day out, or week in, week out, right? Higher level competition in terms of the league. But it's a really great place that he's at. He's in a great position with the national team, with the club. Um, So why kind of move anywhere right now? Maybe, you know, next year. Yeah, and honestly, that's what he did at Philly, right? You know, he really broke out, um, you know, was was a lock starter for Philly and uh, really was the catalyst to their team for, for a few years. And finally, at the end of that time, I felt like he really just, you know, mastered MLS, so to speak. Um, you know, he was a player that in each game he played in towards the end of his career there um, in Philly was was a difference maker for them in, in games. And I'm really getting that same feeling from him in Salzburg right now. Um, he's grown comfortable in the league. He knows how to play uh, well. And, you know, Austin. Goals and assists, even higher level now that he's left from Philly. Yeah. No, that's very true. Yeah. And, he, and he's able to, like, use his skills to his ability. Right, Pat? Like, he's able to to really kind of hone yeah. in on what he's good at and, and you know, use that to, to create chances for him and, and teammates. And I think he's just, you know, done a really fantastic job here, uh, especially this season in Salzburg. So to take a look real quick before we move on, um, you know, Salzburg are in the Champions League this year. So really cool to see that. And, uh, you know, Brendan played 90 minutes versus Wolfsburg uh, today. Actually, we're recording this on a Tuesday, uh, but Wolfsburg unfortunately beat them 2-1. Uh, so, you know, not not a, a great result for them today. And, um, you know, not, I guess, the best game from, from Brendan, although he did play pretty decent today against a, a tough Bundesliga team. Uh, but they sit right now uh, first in that group with seven points through four games. So two two games left. Uh, Lil's five, uh, sitting at five points, excuse me, in second place. So, you know, they have that two two point uh, cushion on Lil, uh, which they play, I think, next game, maybe the last game of this group. Um, so it'll be kind of interesting to see if they can, you know, advance in the Champions League and, and do better than they did last year. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be tough, right? One of those Americans, uh, we got Brooks, right? Way up. Yeah. One of them might get dropped down the Europa League. It's Whoa. it's an American heavy uh Champions League group. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, we'll definitely have to see you there. And yeah, I mean, um, that'd be great to see him in, in the dying rounds of the, the round of sixteen and whoever he goes up against and maybe plays an elite team uh from another league and, and gets more eyes on him. So It'll be exciting to see where he goes, but um, I guess do you want to kind of take it here to to Spain and talk about obviously Sergio Des, but also the management situation in Barcelona. Um, you know, obvi- obviously uh, Ronald is no more. Uh, the Dutchman has been relieved of his duties, and yeah, I think j- just a brutal ending, you know, for him, and, and really kind of no hope uh, in terms of. You know, what he was doing, just throwing stuff against the wall, playing players in, in random positions, and you could just see it was on the last legs. And uh, before he got on the flight, right back from a uh, you know a tough loss, <laughs> um, yeah, he was the coach, and then midway through the through the flight, uh, before they landed, already fired. So definitely probably one of the, one of the worst uh, plane rides there I can imagine. Um, it'll be curious to see how that impacts Dest, right? So Dest, obviously, for recent games in this past weekend too even with the interim manager right um from barca b uh, barjuan there uh while they're they're looking right he started at right wing again uh in a tough 1-1 draw against alibis so still not getting the wins and the results it's a weird time transition right to find that manager um, but that's really putting them at a, a critical place in the league and and, and obviously dest uh it just we, we know it right he's he's not a a natural right winger, um, you know, one of those attacking outside back so it can get forward. Um, but hopefully the next manager will play him more in his position 
um, <laughs> you know, get him back into what he knows. But yeah, just just kind of not to say toothless from him necessarily, but the entire team just in a flux right now, and they really need that spark, that that uh, something to ignite them. Yeah, and, and I think the biggest thing about Ronald Koeman leaving is that, you know, Serginio Dest was one of the players he really admired and, and was a player they really favored. So hopefully, you yeah. know, this, this change up here at Barca won't affect his playing time. And, and I don't think it will. I think, you know, he's shown this team, uh, you know, again, this summer, you know, he beat out Emerson for the starting right back position. Uh, ever since Barca has been kind of anemic in attack, they look to Dest to provide on the right wing. So uh, I think it just shows that he's that multi-talented right back that they've been looking for, uh, you know, since Danny Alves left, right? Like that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what they're, they're, you know, what they see in him, I should say. Um, so I don't think that's going to change, but yeah, it's definitely tough, you know, going through a, a, a coaching change mid season, um, you know, just, just for the team and, and also, you know, Dest himself. Um, I'm sure it's not going to be easy in the coming months to kind of pick up the pieces and, and learn a whole new system and, and play a different way. But, uh, you know, I think there is one one coach that, you know, we would love to see there that that could be a really cool kind of, um, you know, situation for Serginio to, to kind of learn more and, and also get a, an eye back on Barca, um, you know, bring them back to kind of prominence, so to speak. Yeah, and that's Chavi, right? Club legend, Austin. Um, Gotta so, hire him. What, what, yeah, what yeah. else? Who else? Who else is he gonna go after? What else is he doing in Qatar? He's got to go back to Barca. Yeah, you got to go back, and uh, <laughs> you can bring any as like an assistant coach or something, or like technically. Right? <laughs> um, and yeah, bring back I mean, Messi, Tommy. and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, sporting director. Uh, I think you said that too. You wanted to be a sporting director, maybe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that would be awesome. Just, just, uh, and you've touched on it too off camera. We've talked about the way he has, uh, you know, his club over there um, playing. Uh, and just having the experience, I think, obviously, comparing it to the Pirlo, right, that legend, club legend player right into a uh, high, stressful Juventus situation, right? Not ideal, but at least Xavi's got gone out, right? More worldly experience as a manager. Um, and I'm sure, you know, do- doesn't have the, the resources there, right, to... Uh, you know, have everything at his disposal and, and building a team from that is definitely awesome. We see the style of the play and the philosophy. Uh, he knows the club. Uh, obviously, you know, somebody that, that everybody idolizes, right, is a hero, but um, he might be the man to, to turn the team around. And, uh, yeah, I think they just need somebody from that that Tiki Taka prime era to come back. And, and they're so disjointed right now and sitting ninth, they're five or six points back from a Europa League spot right now. <laughs> Which is a huge hole. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they'll they'll be able to get it back on track. But if they miss out in Champions League, that would just be unbelievable. And uh, I think you're right, Austin. Chavi is the man for the job. Yeah, it's weird to even think about you know Barcelona not being in the in the Champions League. And same with Juventus, right? Yeah, they're, yeah what's happening? <laughs> yeah, it's and it's crazy. You know, you think about the Super League last year, right? And how these teams would be guaranteed uh, a spot in the Champions League, so to speak. And uh, yeah, it looks like you know that that whole uh, open structure is is making things a little interesting nowadays. So yeah, right. Yeah, so I think with that, you know, we're gonna uh, you know end this segment today, and uh, now head over to quick kicks. All right, yeah, fans, I think you know what time it is. It's my favorite time of the show. It's Austin's. I know it's yours, right? I don't have to keep saying it at this point, but let's get into it. It's none other than quick kicks. And to begin quick kicks, we're heading over to France with our boy Timo. Uh, came on as a substitute in the last 11 minutes and a tough 2-1 loss against his boys Neymar and company, right, in PSG. Yeah, and going over to Switzerland, we have Pifok, who started and played 90 minutes in a 2-1 loss to St. Gallen. Ah, tough loss. And uh, heading over to the English Championship with Anthony Robinson. Started and played the full 90 in another 3-0 win against West Brom. So... Uh, let's get him back to the top flight. Yeah, that's very true. Let's let's hope that's the case. And uh, going over to Germany, we have Tyler Adams, who started, played 90 minutes, and was player of the match in uh, Leipzig's 1-0 DFB Pokal win. So good to see. And heading back to France, uh, another player, Conrad De La Fuente from Marseille, uh, played 57 minutes in a 1-0 win against Claremont. 
And going over to Belgium, we have Sam Vines, who started and played 90 minutes for Royal Antwerp in their 1-0 win over Circle Bruges. Nice, getting some minutes there. And uh, heading over to Celtic with a Scottish Yankee, Cameron Carter Vickers. Uh, they had 3-1 victory against Hibernian there in the Premiership. And Carter Vickers scored his second goal of the season. Uh, you know, placing in a corner and uh, past the keeper. So also to see him on the score sheet content, constantly uh, get 90 minutes here. Yeah, he's had a pretty good run of form there for Celtic. So good yeah, to see. Really and uh, going over to Germany, we have Evan Rotundo, who scored a goal for Schalke's U19s in their 4-0 win. And Flair and Balagoon there, Austin. Yes. Uh, our boy started and scored. Uh, a tough loss. Uh, he just scored a PK there for the U21s in Arsenal against Plymouth Argyle, and then over the weekend as well for the U23s. Um, you know, he scored there in a 4-2 win against the Leeds. So he's on the score sheet, and, and he just needs to, you know, go to a, another club in a higher level. He's past the U23s. Yeah, yeah, that's what it seems like. He's not gotten the game time with Arsenal, uh, you know, with their first team, but really has for their U23s and taken the most of it. So good to see. And going over to Italy, we have Gianluca Busio and Tanner Tessman. Both started, played 90 minutes for Venezia in their 0-0 draw with Genoa. Nice. Awesome to see an American midfield there, uh, the duo. Oh, yeah. And uh, last but not least, an exciting player uh, was Shaq Moore's teammate, uh, Sam Sashoa there. The 22-year-old um, Trinat winger has had a great run of form here. We had a goal and two assists um, and a 4-0 win for Tenerife. So great to see him and, and a player we have to watch out for. So that's all for our show today, guys. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to our channel down below. That's right. And don't forget about that awesome content with Instagram and Twitter. Um, you know, be sure to check those pages out, right? There's a lot going on, and, and you guys need to stay informed. That's true. We also have our merch uh, page that we launched this summer. Uh, some new designs we promise coming in the works. Uh, just need some more time to refine them and get them up, get them up and running. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And uh, link is in the description. So go check that out as well. Yeah, wearing one right now, Austin. Uh, getting ready. Yes. Right? We have a. Uh, Should I say yes? Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> a lot of players rounding into form, right? Uh, great momentum here. Great to have Pulisic back too, right? Fingers crossed there. Um, hopefully, Geo uh, eventually uh, sooner than later. But yeah, rounding into good, some good form before these upcoming qualifiers. That's right. In a big game versus Mexico. So. You know, we, we're, we're really excited for it. We're really getting up for it here in the next week. And, uh, yeah, live we're going to do some – that's right. Live stream is the key word. We're going to do some live streams before that game. Uh, we're also going to do a live stream for the roster announcement that, that night it comes out. And, uh, you know, we got some U20 games coming up as well that we're going to do some, you know, some fun content for because it's been a little while since we've, you know, looked at our youth pool and, and kind of evaluated it. So, uh, you know – that's all on the horizon, and uh, we're really excited about it. And, uh, Pat, that leads to, to one thing, right? All these these tournaments, yeah. all these players getting better. I can see it off the horizon, right? A little bit farther there. Um, and I guess I'll take it, right, Austin? Because one you day go for it. we will win the World Cup.